Okay, we're on. All right, great. Uh, welcome to this Hangout on Air, hosted by Educator Innovator. Before we get started, I'd like to give a special welcome to the educators joining us from throughout the Educator Innovator Network. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Educator Innovator, it provides an online meetup for those who are reimagining learning. Educator Innovator is both a blog and a growing network of educators, partners, and supporters. If we want to educate a generation of young people to be innovators, to create, build, design, and use their talents to improve their world, we need to value the creative capacity in the mentors and teachers who support them. To learn more, join the Educator Innovator blog at blog.nwp.org slash educator innovator. So uh, my name is Megan, and I'm joining this Hangout today from DIY where we're going to be talking all about the DIY skills and how we're working to map those skills to um, existing standards that a lot of educators are facing currently. Um, my role at DIY is as outreach coordinator, so I'm fortunate to work with many fantastic educators who are currently using DIY in their classrooms and beyond. Um, and Jim is with us, actually a DIY educator himself. Jim, would you like to give an introduction yourself? Hi. I'm Jim Chandler. I'm the consulting teacher, kind of a science curriculum coordinator for the Auburn School Department. It's a kind of a medium-sized uh, rural urban school district in Maine. Um, I've been involved with DIY and also been involved with um, um, doing, uh, uh, looking at the new next generation science standards. Great. Joe, would you like to make an introduction? Oh. Hey, Joe, I think you're muted. Uh, I was muted. <laughs> I mean, I think you're muted. That's right. Sorry. <laughs> so, sorry about that. I'm Joe Dillon, and I'm coming to you from Denver, Colorado, where I work for the Aurora Public School District as a coordinator for educational technology. And I've also had the opportunity to work with the uh, Denver Writing Project and the National Writing Project. And some of the things I've done with the National Writing Project, I had a chance to work on the uh, Literacy in the Common Core Initiative. That was a two-year two -year kind of study of curriculum design and the Common Core Standards. So I'm excited about our conversation tonight. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Paul O. I'm with the National Writing Project. I uh, get a chance to do a lot of different things, um, but one of those things is uh, coordinate with great partners under the Educator Innovator umbrella, great partners like DIY. Uh, so it's uh, fantastic to be here to be part of this conversation. Um, Megan reached out to the National Writing Project uh, to talk with us about this idea of mapping standards to the uh, skills at DIY. Uh, so. It's uh, great to be able to have this conversation via the webinar, and I'm looking forward to hearing questions from the chat, and I'll definitely feed those questions into the webinar. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so it might be helpful to get started by just providing a little more context about DIY and uh, what it is that uh, we have going on as far as our skills and uh, some of the goals that we have around mapping these skills to standards. So um, I should say that we, we started this effort about a year and a half ago really with kids as the primary focus of, of building a tool specifically for kids um, with this really grand goal of you know, helping kids to self-organize their, their own education culture. And we, we thought that by doing so, we could um, create skills for certain things that we were excited about. Um, you know, things like Illustrator and Paper Crafter, uh, Circuit Bender, etc. And, and really listening to that crowd of kids uh, as far as what they were interested in learning about and trying to assemble the, the proper resources to help them do that. Um, it's only been very recently that we've, we've started considering how we can be um, we can be building proper resources for educators to be supporting their students and to be supporting kids in, in this same mission. So um, actually, Jim, who um, has been using DIY for coming up on a year now, it seems, um, I remember you know, getting emails from Jim back in January about um, what, what he was trying to do with his students and, and trying to uh, make something work out of the, the existing skill set that we had and, and trying to to blend that into his curriculum. So it's very exciting that he could be here today and talk a little bit more about what that process has been like for him. Um, 
but another thing that I, I really want to get into is thinking about this uh, very nuanced set of standards that teachers are up against currently and, and thinking about how we can be uh, fitting in with that and, and, and supporting that. So, um, you know, what I'd like to kind of start off with and, and think about is just, um, you know, what what our understanding is of these standards. Um, you know, if, if, if teachers feel like they they have a clear uh, expectation of, of what uh, can be accomplished with these standards and, and you know, if, if they feel prepared, I guess, um, going into this. You know, Common Core and, and NGSS will, will really be where we're focused today, being uh, that Joe has uh, his experience and in, in, uh, in background in Common Core and, and Jim with his experience uh, in, in the, na uh, the next generation science standards. Um, so we'll really kind of be focusing in those two areas, but when I say standards, it's really, um, you know, broadly as well, so. So, um, Joe, I wonder if that's uh, something you'd, you'd like to kind of get started in thinking about that as far as um, your preparedness, I guess, and what you've been doing to get ready for, for Common Core. Yeah, well, in terms of, how much have you been doing to get ready? I think that um, Common Core, Common Core is something that is still on the horizon for us here in Colorado because we're currently still working with old Colorado standards, looking towards um, Common Core standards coming into effect next year for our teachers, and that's also when they'll be assessed according to Common Core standards. And so, so to some degree, we've been doing you know work in advance to to best prepare our teachers and, and talk about how curriculum realignment might look. And then I think that one of the things that's come up with Common Core is uh, there's a certain amount of mythology that we have to combat. So, you know, the list of standards themselves certainly suggest a lot of changes. And then I think that um, as we work to support teachers, we also have to help them understand um, fact from fiction around what will this really change in their classrooms. and so. You know, preparedness is something that we're all trying to understand. I guess we won't really know until we assess students against these standards, and we have a few years, and certainly seeing any assessed will always help us, you know, better understand how well prepared we are, I guess. And Joe, I'm, I'm wondering um, if, if I could just jump in with a question here. I'm wondering, Joe, if the, uh, the idea of the Common Core standards in relation to the kinds of um, skills that exist at DIY, if that um, you know seems to make sense, or is that in, in Congress? You know, how, how do you think about standards as you're applying them in general to um, you know work that students might do um, that isn't necessarily um, you know, that kind of like packaged curriculum that sometimes is designed, you know, to be uh, standards related. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's that what we're starting to experience is that most every educational material or every educational resource these days is now coming stamped with Common Core state standards written on it, right? I mean, Everything is Common Core state standards aligned. If it's you know, if someone's hoping to sell it to the educational community, and so some of the things that I've been intrigued by in, in my work with other folks affiliated with the National Writing Project are just questions about how we might hack the standards and how we might look at look at the standards. You know, Megan said we might look at them broadly, but I'd also encourage that we look at them very specifically as just a list of standards that doesn't necessarily have to drive us towards traditional curriculum. So, I mean, not to go too deep into the Common Core standards, but, you know, if we get beyond the list of standards that are there and, and talk about what we might assess students, you know, how we might assess students, there are also things like the appendices that give us text lists and sample, um, sample assessment items. So those aren't the standards themselves, but those are suggestive of traditional curriculum, and that's that's one of the places I'd like to be able to set those things aside and say, well, if we just look at the list of standards, then a lot of what a student might be engaged in or a young person might be engaged in on DIY 
certainly has worked towards a standard. It's certainly work we can understand through the lens of a standard. So there are a lot of things around the periphery of Common Core standards that might take us to more traditional approaches. But I think that it's also, I, I think our challenge is to innovate and to find ways to still meet the standards while not limiting our view of what can happen in a classroom or a school for students. Right, that's, that's, a, that's a really great point, Joe, and that's certainly something that we're sensitive of at DIY. Of course, um, you know, we're, we're really uh, hesitant to, to package something that is this end-all, be-all solution um, or a literal pathway of, you know, from point A to point B and, and you know, meeting these standards and meeting these expectations, but rather as a supplemental tool um, and as something that um, can can be a support and to uh, open a larger conversation. I think that's really key. Uh, Paul and I, in, in you know, having some conversations around this in, in the previous weeks, I think that was one of the things that I got most excited about was thinking about the potential of uh, opening up the conversation, getting, getting this so that it's something that teachers are, are utilizing DIY skills and utilizing the pathways that we've sort of laid out around t particular uh, subject areas, whether it be literacy or math or science, um, and, and kind of sharing those with their students in a way that they can pick and choose, that they can kind of dive deeper where it makes sense for them um, and, and make those connections on their own, but then allowing for that um, assessment to happen through conversations. So uh, teachers are, are, you know, letting kids explore independently, but then, uh, you know, maybe it's in a group setting, maybe it's something that's happening um, through uh, journals. Uh, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's something where we're just kind of starting to think about what that might look like as far as the, the true assessment of understanding. Yeah. Megan, I think you make a great point when you talk about the the idea that assessment might involve a conversation between the teacher and the student, and that I think any educator looking through DIY's website will see a lot of um, work that youth take great pride in, and that is a great jumping off point for conversations with those students about what did they learn, what might they do next. And certainly a standard is, is a lens to ask a student to look through. And it doesn't have to be a limiting factor, especially when you start to see the, I mean, just some of the inspired work that is clearly interest-driven for those students and is also peer-supported on that site. So I agree with you about the role of conversation. And I also think that, you know, we don't have to let the standards limit us. And, and a site like DIY certainly suggests, a, ought to suggest a lot of possibilities, you know, for educators, particularly around conversations with students about interests, what they might, what they've learned. And, what they think are next steps. And you know, if I can just jump in and say, I think that's um, you know that that's such, such an interesting point that you make, Joe. Because in my conversations with Megan and with Andrew um, Slowinski, uh, who developed this site and uh, you know developed this concept of DIY, um, you know, I I get the sense that the notion of interest driven is uh, and youth passion is just the fundamental uh, bedrock for the work that you know Megan and Andrew and the rest of the DIY team are doing and so this notion of thinking about the standards is is really and perhaps I'm just reiterating what Megan has said earlier but is is about um, helping teachers uh, navigate the kind of um, requirements that are put before them as they're attempting to um, you know do what they think is in the best interests of their youth um, and utilizing resources that maybe are not necessarily um, put forward or you know mandated by their district. So I think that that's such an interesting point. You know this this uh, this notion of um, being able to really honor and um, support youth as they're engaging in interest-driven work that is so much a part of DIY. And Definitely. in fact, I, I would just add one one other thing, which. Some of the stories that Megan and Andrew told during a recent meeting about uh, just the outgrowth of, of work, um, not even the, the skills and challenges themselves, um, but, you know, work that youth were led to do as a result, you know, is just really fascinating and, um, you know, could be aligned to standards, but in some senses is beyond uh, any kind of standards thinking in a way. Um, or not beyond, but it's it's just it's you know it's it's these wonderful examples I think of of the 
the passion that youth have um, that pushes them forward beyond you know beyond what like any sort of standards document might say. Absolutely, Paul. Yeah, I, I would say that those are some of the most exciting moments for us when we see uh, kids sharing teachable moments with one another and, and pushing one another uh, th through commenting on projects and, and just that, that dialogue that happens between kids, um, which is really exciting not only that it's it's peer-to-peer, -peer, but that it's a global community of kids. So, um, you know, you may have a student in Jakarta, Indonesia, who's connecting with kids in, in Jim's class in, in Auburn, Maine, and, you know, just to think about the, the feedback that they can share with one another and what they are sharing with one another is really exciting for sure. Um, to, to the point that I, I'm seeing a, a comment that was shared from Chad about this idea of teacher and kid field notes, I really love that idea and I'd, I'd love to, um, to get some, some feedback from, from Jim around uh, some, something very similar that he's actually attempting with, with his students and, and how they're using DIY with their science journals. Um, I wonder if you might be able to elaborate on that, Jim. Oh, it looks like your mic might be muted, so just... How's that? Is that better? Okay. Um, well, I'd also like to tie in with the, the Next Generation Science Standards because I think you might be more familiar with the Common Core. Um, but the next gener the whole thrust of the next generation science standards isn't to separate the, the practices from the content, um, but they they have three threads going on and each thread is included in every standard. So they have uh, the, uh, the science and engineering practices and they also have cross-cutting concepts and disciplinary core ideas in each standard. And so the intent is not just to teach concepts, but make sure that they're taught in, through an inquiry base through the science and engineering practices as well. And DIY is very much a learning by doing kind of approach. Um, so I think that works out very well. Um, to talk to what Megan was saying is that one of the things I've been really working on to make the learning more reflective and more um, student driven is to encourage students to to do science journaling and there's a there's a whole body of work about scientist notebooks or science notebooks where the students not only are taking notes but but they're they're recording their reflections they're recording the um, results of their experiments and so forth very much like field notes um, and we found that to be really valuable in terms of um, continuing the conversation and bringing those notes to a conversation about what's what did, what did you find out, what did it mean, um, and then sharing your results back and forth using your notes. And, and then they have a, an ongoing record of what they're doing as well. So that's been, that's been very useful. And it's also very strong in developing literacy skills as well, and the writing as, long as, as well as the science skills. So it's been a good good way to integrate it. Another part that I wanted to sh wanted to show as well is just in, in doing a little thinking and looking at, at standards, one of the kind of uh, mnemonic ways we train teachers to uh, look at how a lesson should be focused is using the inquiry method, using what they call the five E's, and DIY does all of them, and that's engage and, and having student-driven projects that's very engaging. Um, and to explore, it's not so much telling them what to do, but giving them a, a way to, to explore what they're doing. And DIY is all about the explanation. The explanation piece, again, there may be more of that conversation that needs to happen to cover that. Um, same thing with elaboration is, is really looking more deeply at a topic. And what better way to look deeply at a topic than try to apply what you're learning. And then evaluation, again, that, that may include um, more conversations and so forth. So that might be another aspect along with rubrics to, to tie in with what we can really demonstrate. 
so I wonder, both Joe and Jim, in, in preparing for these standards and, and you know, doing uh, all the research that you have around this, what are some of your, your uh, feelings on, on the greatest challenges that you're facing with this? Um, you know, is that documenting the assessment? Is that, um, you know, fitting, fitting into a specific mold? I mean, it, what I'm hearing from a lot of teachers is that uh, there, there is such an open-endedness to these standards that um, there's great potential for, you know, getting creative with, with how we're meeting them, but in some ways it can be overwhelming. So I guess, you know, I uh, just wanted to hear from, from the two of you in, in both NGSS and Common Core uh, what you're thinking will be the greatest challenge for that. I, well, I think that, uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is from the Common Core standpoint is that um, it really sec uh, really establishes that every teacher is a teacher yeah. of reading and writing because they they've offered English language arts standards for um, or reading and writing standards for um, science and technical subjects for um, you know for all content areas for social studies and so different content area teachers who may or may not have work to develop students as readers and writers are now kind of clearly charged with that task. And so that's a learning curve. That's, I mean, that, you know, for folks who've been affiliated with the writing, pro the writing project, we know about the importance of making the ri writing processes, you know, demystifying them for students and engaging them in meaningful practice and, you know, trying to, uh, trying to just facilitate, um, you know, creative student work while also improving student work. I think that that's one of the challenges that's offered by the Common Core Standards that will be a challenge for teachers. It's those other content areas having to support reading and writing. Other things I think is uh, Common Core Standards put a premium on research, so I think it'll push schools to think through what meaningful research is. Yeah. And lastly, I think that Common Core suggests that writing ought to play a bigger part in assessment. And so that kind of ties in with the first one, that everybody becomes a teacher of writing. If writing becomes one of the more dominant modes of assessment, that's a big change that schools will have to adapt to. I think with the next generation science standards, um, again, that integration of science and engineering uh, is, uh, and throughout the whole curriculum, is going to be a, a big big challenge for some teachers because they're, they've been used to um, more of the content driven uh, teaching and it looks like a lot more work but what it's forcing teachers to do is to teach use the, the inquiry techniques that we've, we've known all along that really make the, the best impact on student learning so it's it's really moving education towards best practices that we've we've been trying to promote all along but it by bringing the standards together it really um, strengthens the whole piece um, we just got a great question from uh, Stephen around stem versus steam and I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on that Joe and and Jim as well around um, you know what what that might look like and, and how um, so b basically his question is asking why is there such a big wow on adding arts to the STEM criteria they call it STEAM will common core standards closely follow STEM or even STEAM so uh, what are your thoughts around uh, getting excited and, and, and uh, feeling compelled to be blending STEM or STEAM practices into your to your teaching to fulfill common core or NGSS Well, I guess I might defer to Jim, except to say that I think that the idea of STEAM, to me, uh, maybe it's my bias, but I think that the idea that we might also think about arts um, really pushes us to think about maker culture, making is learning, and that, and that making and creativity play a role when we think about science, technology, and math. Again, I, I defer to Jim, except to say that I do think that point is maker culture and creative. Well, the interesting thing about STEM and STEAM both, well, one, I think it, it's, it's, 
it's breaking down the barriers between um, subject, matter, so subject matters. In other words, I may be teaching science, but I'm also teaching writing and communication and analysis and math all at once. Um, I find, uh, personally, um, even the, the whole thing about STEM education, it seems like they're, the whole emphasis on it is in engineering, which, um, coming from a biology background, not everything's necessarily engineered solution, um, but what it really does emphasize is that, that application of science, um, whether it be to a, uh, whether it be through some sort of a technology or um, things of that sort. Um, I think art, the addition of art is great, you know, um, journaling also includes uh, diagrams, illustrations, I mean, they're all a good way of communicating, so I encourage the use of diagrams and and illustrations and and sculptures as other ways of, of being able to express themselves. Let me just say really quickly, uh, and I don't know if you plan this, Jim, but uh, there are a number of National Writing Project mm -hmm. teachers in the audience, and they just love the emphasis that um, you're you're putting on uh, writing and you know that as a tool for communication, as well as um, you know, the way that you're describing it as a tool for making meaning. So you have a lot of fans. I just wanted to jump Thanks. in. Thanks. In, in the it's chat. Also, it's also a great way of doing a, uh, evaluation because it's a teacher, when they're using the traditional methods without, without the writing piece and the reflective piece, oftentimes they get a sense of, of um, the collective knowledge of the class. Um, so you might think, Oh, we get one or two students that are answering lots of questions, then they get think, oh, the lesson's going well, but really it's one or two students that understand as well. But when they look, when, if they look at their notebooks and they look at people's reflective writing on it, they really get a sense of how each student is is in, impacted by the learning. So, yeah, I find that the journaling is a, a very very useful tool. And if I could also just say that. Um, you know, I, I've I've been in a couple of long conversations about about journals, science journals, and I think it's really fascinating to think about the long history of science journals as a place that um, you know that that actually did incorporate. I mean, I think of like, for instance, um, Charles Darwin making his drawings and and writing and essentially keeping in his notebook, uh, you know, his his field notes essentially. Um, and I just think about the long history of, of uh, that sort of multimodal composing practice as being an integral par part of science learning um, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, personally uh, motivating um, or motivated learning. So just want to point that out. And I, I wanted to also just say that I think what, um, and I know that Megan and Andrew have um, talked with us a little bit about this or we've talked to them about this idea of, and this is maybe a little bit far afield in terms of standards, but if we're on the, the writing path for a moment, I think what's really interesting is, and maybe Megan can talk a little bit about, you know, the, the kind of writing that exists at DIY, because I think that there are many facets to it, but I know that Andrew and Megan have also troubled, like, the kind of writing that exists at DIY, and they, they, they want to make it more robust. And I think one of the ideas that we've talked about is, you know, writing as itself an act of production. Um, writing, you know, writing as a as a making um, creation, and so so I think you know that has lots of possibilities and um, in, interesting potential um, and dimensions. Uh, so I realize that that's a little bit far afield from this whole notion of standards um, mapping, but. But I think, you know, for our audience, they might be interested in hearing some aspects of the kind of writing that exists at DIY, and then some of the thoughts that, you know, you and the rest of your team, Megan, have uh, in terms of what this might look like moving forward. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about that, of, of course, and someone might just have to pull me back a little bit if I get a little too far out there, but um, absolutely, you know, it's it's really exciting to, to see the way that, that the kids on DIY are, are utilizing the existing writing skills that we have. Um, skills like writer and journalist um, have been really, you know, wildly popular with kids, and and even writer specifically um, was one of our first kid co-authored skills. So 
Um, currently, the skills are, are authored by our team. Um, there are a list of resources within each skill that provide projects and ideas for one to dive deeper into to what that skill set means. And writer was one that uh, a kid, Apple Turnip, <laughs> from the DIY community, um, was very excited and eager to to you know uh, to share out with with the DIY community at large. And so worked with one of our team members to to get that out there. So. Um, Currently, as it exists, uh, the ability for kids to share their projects on DIY is a little clunkier than we would like. Um, Andrew is, is actively working with our product team to build some uh, tools for kids to be able to share uh, a more robust uh, writing projects so um, you know right now they're able to start a blog you know uh, on another on another platform and share those links on DIY but what we're hoping to do very soon is to allow for them to uh, upload different media types specifically text um, writing code you know I, I realize it's a bit of a, it's a bit tangential from some of this other uh, literacy uh, conversations that we're having and thinking about the the writing skills but of course you know we can't ignore that as well, um, and and so you know it's it's something that when we do have these resources in a place where they can uh, be sharing that, it, I think it's going to be really exciting to see how that changes and um, you know just a, a better support for their their voice. Um, you know what kids have been able to do though with the existing tools that they have on DIY is pretty phenomenal. Um, Paul and I were able to to talk about this. Uh, group that's formed on DIY called the DIY Times. So there was this self-organized group of kids who took it upon themselves to start a, a newspaper on DIY. And um, so they, you know, just simply by uploading a, a photo to their portfolios on DIY, an image that said, um, I think, something to the effect of, you know, looking for a writing team or looking for a newspaper staff, um, please apply for your position in a comment below. And so instantly there were just uh, dozens, maybe even over a hundred comments from kids that were just, you know, back and forth of, oh, I, I want to be a writer, oh, I want to be an editor, you know, I can do this, and how, how would I help with that? And, and very soon this team was formed, and, um, you know, it's been months now, and they're still, you know, really going at it. I think most of us at DIY uh, get questions from them pretty regularly, regularly looking for the inside scoop on what's happening at DIY. So, um, you know, it's, it's really exciting to see things like that taking shape on DIY and, and you know, just um, to think what, what could happen uh, once, once we're, you know, building stronger resources around that um, will be really exciting for sure. It also be like right now at DIY, you, you post a picture of your project, and there is a comment section, but oftentimes students don't take full advantage of that comment section. Um, that that if we can encourage them more, that that in order to be a full project, it needs a, a picture and a comment. That might be another approach. Um, another way too might be in terms of the use of encouraging journals, might be if there was some sort of experiment or field trip that one of the pictures might be a picture of their field note mm -hmm. and and you know maybe a graph of their results or mm -hmm. what's the table of their results or things of that sort so that might be another way to deepen the the conversation about what they what they did and i i have to say i love the fact that there's there's um, so much uploading of media uh, of images and video um, that's fantastic, and and you know we at the National Writing Project really think of all those forms of expression as as uh, being essentially writing today. Um, so it's exciting also um, to think about you know how those media formats might even expand at DIY. I know that um, you guys are thinking about that possibility as well, but you know that's really exciting, and I think it it uh, fits right in with you know our notion of what writing looks like today among youth, among adults, among everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Paul, one thing I noticed um, going through DIY myself and thinking through the lens of how does this support a move toward Common Core, I noticed a few different things under, I think there's a skills under journalist, right? And what I, what I noticed, especially with, um, you know, with the emphasis on research, and I think it's incumbent upon us to always keep thinking what is authentic research, and what I found on DIY were all, I mean, I think there's a specific skill under, you know, conducting small interviews and students were sharing out the questions they'd written. And that type of informal writing, you know, to, to prepare for an interview, I mean, 
that's writing too, and that's valuable, especially when the, the digital product that, that is produced you know, is something that a student's proud of and they get comments on. I think that's really important. And another thing that I stumbled across under journalists was just a small number of students who had taken the opportunity to uh, be a sports reporter. And I think that that, the composition there, although the students were speaking into a camera and, and you know, essentially cre creating like, you know, a video report, their reports were clearly written. And I also know that in school so often, um, the, I the opportunity to be a sports reporter, for example, at my high school was really limited to two or three kids who made the newspaper staff and then were assigned these, these tasks. And you think about how many students don't get the opportunity to be a sports reporter. And DIY gives you some insight into who might opt in to these types of writing that clearly, you know, you could look at through the lens of a standard. So, I mean, I think there are really exciting opportunities, and I was impressed by the amount of writing that was shared, even in places where it didn't explicitly call for students to share their writing. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. It's, you know, it's exciting to hear you say that, Joe, and, and I always get excited when uh, getting to, to chat with Jim around some of the ways he's been getting creative with DIY and, and utilizing that for, for curriculum. Um, but, you know, I'm wondering, what sort of, uh, do you feel as if there needs to be this added validity to the work that kids are doing on DIY in a way that can map to standards or in a way that can be recognized as uh, a valuable uh, learning experience that that's you know kind of um, maybe sort of checking these standards off a list and, and you know kind of hesitant around saying that exactly because you know that's really not not exactly what we want to see happening you know we don't expect you to to have this list where you're checking off your standards but um, I guess what I'm asking is do you feel do you Jim and Joe feel that you're you're up against that and that you're needing to do this checking off of a list. Well, our, our school is also going to what they call mass customized learning, which is going to be um, very proficiency-based, and so they're going to have uh, key skills that kids actually need to show proficiency and check off, and, and usually two different ways to show that they, they're proficient in a particular skill rather than just a certain score or a certain seat time in order to, become, to meet the graduate, graduation requirements. Um, give me an example. I thought I thought uh, it might be illustrative to pick a next generation science standard and see how a DIY project or a similar project might be applied. So I picked one from from the next generation science standard. This is a a fifth grade ecosystem interaction, energy, and dynamics standard, and it shows. In the past, you might have s said something like show how matter and, uh, is cycled between plants, animals, and decomposers. Well, it now reads develop a model, so that's the science project or the science practice to describe a movement of matter among plants, animals, decomposers, and environment. And it, what we've done is have students build um, bottle terrariums and aquariums, and within that they've got all the material cycles and and all the uh, interaction of, of uh, decomposers and, and food chains and so forth. Um, but just by creating it isn't enough to say that, they've, that they understand it. It's developing a model, so it's doing it by doing. So it increase, in, in, encourages that part. But then they need to journal or verbally describe what's going on in this, in this environment. Where are the cycles going on? Where are the where are the interactions between the animals and the, the living and non-living parts of it? So I can see that making a really robust part of the curriculum by using this project as the focus, and then and then reflecting upon how it all works. Joe, what about you? Is is there? Um, I guess you know. I think. Jim has a pretty optimistic perspective on, on the whole NGSS. I know since we've been talking about it, he's been really excited about the potential of NGSS and, and you know, what can happen with that. And it's less of a, an expectation on, you know, checking anything off of a list. Is it, is it feeling similarly with, with what you're up against with Common Core? And, um, 
what what's that sort of process like, I guess? Well, I guess um, I don't know that I have reason to be optimistic, but I am optimistic and I'm hopeful. So some of the reasons I'm optimistic and hopeful are that having a common set of standards and, you know, there being a trending towards standards-based grading, I think it ought to allow for students to meet the standards in different ways. And that one of the things that a site like DIY might do is suggest other possibilities for students, right? There might be multiple ways to meet a certain standard. And if a, a district or a school has to prescribe what standards are taught in what quarter, for example, then what a, a site like DIY might do is identify some other ways that we hadn't previously thought about for students to pursue those standards or, you know, demonstrate mastery in those standards. So, you know, I mean, standards-based grading ought to allow for a diverse range of student products or student, you know, demonstrations of skills. And, you know, I think, you know, this maybe hopefully takes, like, some of the creative work off of a teacher's plate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely, um, that, that's, that's been a common conversation that I've had with a lot of educators is uh, thinking about how, how DIY can do exactly that and provide that, um, you know, relief of creative thought process around, around curriculum and how, um, you know, it can, it can be a little less rigid in that way. And um, so I'm hoping that that's something that we can um, you know, something that we'll maintain through this whole process, of course, that'll be uh, a focus for us in, in keeping it something that is fun. And, um, you know, even, even through building these resources specifically for educators and, you know, in, in mapping skills to standards, um, we don't want to lose that, that sense of play that, that's definitely there on DIY. Um, and, of course, you know, the tools and resources that, that exist in their current state on DIY are for kids, and and so of course that that tone is is going to feel that way. But you know, as we build more robust tools for teachers, we really want to maintain that. We want this to be something that's um, still a lot of fun for them as well, and and can be uh, a creative place to to think about how how to be innovative with with their teaching process for sure. Well, that whole piece of creating an environment for engagement is is perfect for DIY. And the cool part about it also is it's not just um, science-based, it's, it's engineering-based, it's craft-based, it's arts-based, it's writing-based, it's computer programming-based, uh, math-based, history-based. So there's lots of different entry points um, for any one given topic, and they can use the skills in DIY to find a place that fits them and then apply it to whatever learning that they need to 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 show proficiency in. So yeah, I like the multiple ways and it it really does capture students' imagination. So um, I'd, I kind of want to elaborate a little more on some of these tools that I'm, I'm referencing here when I'm talking about the teacher tools and how that might be different from what the tools that currently exist on DIY and what that might look like um, exactly. And, and I'd love to hear your feedback, um, you know, from, from the community joining us tonight and, and from you, Jim and Joe. Uh, you know, we're thinking about creating sort of a lens for teachers. So currently uh, the site is in a way that kids can explore these skills and that they can determine, you know, the pathways that they're choosing to, to you know, take on mastery in any certain subject. Um, what we want for teachers is to, to continue that same layer of skills, um, that same visual mapping of, you know, um, recognizing that certain science skills are all going to be lumped near one another, where literacy skills are all lumped near one another, and so on and so forth. Um, but an added layer of uh, context and how that, that might make sense to some of these standards specifically, um, and, and thinking about the tools, materials, resources that will be helpful in, in you know, bringing that curriculum or bringing that skill programming into their classroom. Um, so, you know, this is still something that we're, we're really in the development stages of. Andrew and I have been working closely on this and, um, you know, we're, we're hoping to have something like this to share with teachers very soon. Um, but in, in the short term, we're still really kind of uh, sorting through what that looks like exactly. And so, you know, I, I just, I'm curious, like, what, what would be the ideal uh, 
tool set for you in coming into DIY and in seeing the skills as they are, um, what would need to be added to, to give that context, whether it is maybe needing that validity mapped out to standards, maybe it's you know the materials that go into to doing certain projects, um, or just generally understanding you know what's happening <laughs> in there. Um, another thing I should add to that too as well is that um, we're, we're working on creating these mentor accounts. So in addition to resources and materials that you might be able to um, sort through on DIY, having the ability to interact and sort of engage with that community as, as a, 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 you know, a part of the community. So Jim actually has joined uh, DIY as a mentor account. Um, he's able to follow his students on there um, and see the projects they're working on. So uh, that's just kind of what we're thinking about as far as these tools and resources and love to hear what that what that sounds like to you all. Well, I think I guess my my first thought is that uh, it DIY to some degree is already a space where it seems like there's some some support across the ages, right? And the idea that there might be some cross generational work and artifacts. So the first thing I'd want teachers to do is to feel uh, to be able to do is to feel free to create there themselves. So they know what the experience the experiences there they might suggest to their students feel like and then also maybe I don't know how this would look but then so that time to you know to do whatever the the skill is or or to make whatever they're supposed to make and then a space to think about themselves as a learner and then and then turn that corner to now how might this be supportive of your students you know in their learning what does this look like in a classroom because I think a lot of times for a, a teacher to work with a tool like that they have to function to some degree as a translator right you you go onto a site like that and you see how students are already engaging and then for students who haven't had access or haven't previously worked there there's some translation work there's a why is this a supportive community and, and what does this work have to look like if it's going to be recognized in my classroom for my grade? So in order to do that translation work, I feel like the teachers need an opportunity to become a little bit fluent and hopefully then interact, interact with other teachers about what are some ways this fits. Yeah, I think others, other things, there is the comment section, but uh, it would be useful if um, there could be uh, like a, uh, a personal journal or blog um, place where students could, could keep, keep track of their work as they, as they go along. Um, there's, a, there's an app that our school district's using, and I'm not, I'm not too familiar with yet, but it's, it's something like an assignment backpack where students can upload their assignments to that and then the students can, the teachers can look through their uh, homework backpack and everything's done electronically rather than, rather than handing in a physical paper. That way there's, there's no loss of the paper, oh I left at home kind of thing. But the students, the, the teacher can leave their comments on, you know, in, in the assignments in the journal as well as the, the 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 student being able to interact back back and forth almost like a sort of a common Google Doc or something of that sort mm -hmm. some place where there could be a larger journal journaling space more than just a, a short comment you know one one thing I wonder about with regard to the you know the how the mentor space might be developed is that so so I, I, one of the things that really appeals to me about DIY is is just that it seems like an incredibly fun and creative space, and and I think that it would be great to be able to replicate that experience in some way for the mentors as well. If the mentors uh, were not, um, and I don't know if this is how uh, how things operate now um, or what the plans are for the future, but I think it's really critical for the mentors to to be a part of the same community as the youth as well. Potentially, um, I mean, I realize that there are probably reasons why the youth themselves, you know, the young people want to have their own community. But 
in some ways, I think the idea that um, the youth themselves can mentor the adults, um, or however that might get set up, mm -hmm. is really critical. Uh, because I think, um, you know, it, it, it just seems really important to me that, you know, that playfulness as well as that notion that we're all learners mm -hmm. is somehow communicated. You know, that seems to permeate, you know, what is true from what I've seen uh, from the youth side of things. I think if it's possible to permeate the mentor space with that kind of ethos, I think that would be wonderful. Certainly, that's that's uh, at the forefront of, of what we're uh, talking about in preparation for creating these mentors accounts, um, and and just generally bringing educators into into this existing community of you know of kids who are already you know with this established system and and uh, culture, and so just wanting to be really sensitive of that. Um, but of course, you know you know I, I realize we're getting close on time, so I'll try not to go. Too on, too long on this, but you know, one of the things that's uh, been happening on DIY that we're we're seeing uh, as these teachable moments primarily has been through what we're, what we're calling forking. So um, this idea of uh, creation of a project, maybe by a kid on DIY, that then has the uh, option with this button that says fork for another kid or adult uh, to see that and replicate their project. So it's to us, it's sort of like um, or we, we see this as the, the greatest form of flattery for, for a maker on DIY, for a kid on DIY, to have your project be recognized as something so enticing or exciting that someone else would want to try that, but also that they might be learning from your process as well. So, um, you know, taking away that layer of uh, teacher and student necessarily, uh, you know, making it sort of just this creation process where uh, each, each kid is sharing their projects um, with the potential to to um, inspire others, and so that's that's what we really want to to see happening. And I think with with creating these mentor accounts, um, we'll want to think about how we can support that type of interaction uh, for for those of us at DIY who, of course, you know, are uh, adults and using DIY alongside these kids. You know, we've been able to just sort of freely interact with them the same way they interact with each other. And to me, I see how excited we all get at DIY and and in you know, I, I want I want to extend that out into the educator community. So, um, you know, I, I'm I'm eager to just you know hand it over, hand the keys over to to all the teachers out there. Um, it, it, of course, it's it's a little more nuanced than that. So we're we're trying to really figure out the best way to do that and and to make it happen really soon. So, can I just say um, to that end, I in looking at the site, I love on the about page uh, when when you look at the DIY staff. And you all have skills badges uh, under your icons, um, which I think is wonderful. You know, it's it's. I, I mean, that 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 sort of ethos is 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 uh, just really great to see. I have to say. And I did I cut you off, Jim? I'm sorry. Well, no? I, I I was going to add to that is is that um, some of that is happening also in the they have a Wednesday day and 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 evening hangouts, and so I I'm getting to meet some of the other club. Club uh, leaders and, and classroom leaders around the country and actually around the world. You know, there's there's some from Jakarta, India that that re check in pretty regularly. And then since that, I've I've checked in with that. Like I'm trying to learn a little bit more about Arduino. So I've checked in with uh, Ben in Portland, Oregon, and he say, "What have you used?" And he's given some of the resources that he's used. And so we're doing some of that sharing. And I know Megan and I have had some discussions of this before there. Before there were mentor accounts, um, it was real tempting to go in and say, you know, here's here's my project, here's my project, and <laughs> the need is to want to primarily make it a kid site, but maybe maybe the mentors could have you know a limited put one or two um, of their recent projects up there and and participate in the badges too. I mean, I'm excited to have my club because I get to do some skills as well, so that's kind of fun. Um, so yeah, it, it is. It's a it's a really neat uh, community feeling that you develop. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Jim. That's uh, it's it's always nice to hear that we do have a really fantastic community uh, of of educators and club leaders all around the world who, and uh, as Jim mentioned, are really supporting one another to continue this movement. Um, so I would love to extend a. Welcome to anyone who's interested. Those do happen on Wednesdays, um, and 
you know, just through our, our regular hangouts with DIY clubs. So, um, but yeah, um, so we're we're getting close to the end here, and I just wanted to make sure that I uh, left some time for any questions or comments that anyone else wanted to to share about this. Um, if anybody had any final thoughts, <laughs> it might be interesting too to do um, hybrid uh, challenges. In other words, do a sort of a science challenge, but then combine that with the journalist challenge. So you can kind of do, uh, so so the, 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 it might be a new kind of skill that would say um, hybrid, take two, take two challenges and combine them. Um, and say, here's, here's my wildlife habitat that I created and here's the article I wrote for the newspaper about the wildlife habitat I created. So um, that and that would be another way of encouraging that interdisciplinary work. Yeah, definitely. That's that's a good point, Jim. So that's something that we do actually support, but possibly could be better about um, explaining. So currently, if a kid were to do a project like you're saying that meets both of those skill expectations, they're able to upload that project and and sort of uh, connect it with both. So one project for multiple challenges is totally acceptable and uh, welcomed. Um, so I am seeing a, a question that we've got from the chat before we uh, wrap up around the idea of um, communities and, and thinking about how um, certain communities may uh, be more um, res uh, kind of uh, not as connected more globally in this way and thinking about uh, ways that we're connecting these different cultures through the standards. And I don't know if that's something that either uh, – Joe or Jim, you have thought about with regards to involving cultures and standards, or if that's something um, that you're hearing about from other teachers. Um, we have a large Somali cop, uh, population in our school district, um, and uh, it would be interesting to combine those um, cultural learnings and uh, as into their skills as well. In other words, write a write a write a a piece about a celebration that you you do during the year, and whether it be um, um, and you could get all kinds of different cultures because again we have we have clubs in Jakarta, India, and so forth. But but you could have um, students writing about Christmas. You could have students writing about Eid. You could have students write about you know a family tradition that they have. Um, I think a multicultural uh, skill would be a would be a great addition, or um, um, you know, specifically about their heritage. Um, there is a historian skill. I don't know if there's is there a genealogy skill. Not yet. No, but it is it is actually in the works. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, those are those are great points. Nice ways to be able to tie that in for sure. Um, and certainly with DIY being uh, connected globally, there's that opportunity to be kind of sharing and connecting with various cultures all over. Um, so, uh, well, great. So um, thank you all so much. This has been really great. And um, if you haven't already, please sign up for the Educator Innovator blog uh, to receive notifications about upcoming opportunities like webinars like this, uh, tweet ups, online resources, and more uh, from the range of Educator Innovator partners. So thank you guys so much. This was a ton of fun. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. 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 Really appreciate it.